I thought before we begin with our how to make botanical paper, we'd start with a tour of the garden because it's from your garden that you'll get a lot of your raw materials. Now, right behind me, you can probably recognize the hippie astrum lily. Now, if you're looking around in your garden for things, asking yourself what could make paper, you're looking for tall, stalky things. So the hippie astrum lily will certainly work. Uh, however, every plant will give a different character to your paper. So just in this part of the garden alone, there are three plants that are really useful for paper making. So we've got our lilies here, and when we do the part two, where we actually cooch some sheets of paper, the fibre we're using is from these hippiastrums, because you can probably see that they've been cut back. So there's certain times of the year where you might be trimming and pruning the garden, where you're going to get a lot of potential paper making ingredients. So the next one, is arrowroot. Now, of course, we use the actual root as a starch, as a food, and we were just talking before about the, the famous arrowroot biscuit, the Arnott's use, well, I, th I think they still make it. So you can see it's got a lot of tall, stalky fibers. So we're not gonna be using these green leaves, we're gonna be using this fiber part. And arrowroot, I've certainly experimented with, and it does make paper. And the third one here, we'll just dash through under the dragon fruit, is lemongrass. Now lemongrass is one of the few fibres that if you harvest it and cook it quite soon and cooch it, you will retain a bit of the green colour. Most, most fibre plants lose their colour when they're cooked for paper making. So plant number three, lemongrass. Being the lucky person I am, I get to have a studio surrounded by subtropical plants and foliage and greenery and nearly every plant that you see in my immediate surrounds is either edible, useful for fire in some way and very often paper making. Now you might be able to get a sense here that I have a lot of aloe vera plants. This is aloe vera barbadensis, the variety of aloe vera that has the very strong medicinal properties against burns and it is also commonly found in a lot of moisturizers. Now aloe vera has two roles in paper making and we're going to go and see what they are. So here we have some nice big chunky leaves from the aloe vera from which I have removed those sharp pointy bits because they can be a bit hard to deal with. Now I'm not using this aloe as a fibre plant in this paper making, I'm using it for its emollient properties. Now I just mentioned about how it's in a lot of moisturisers and burn creams. But in paper making, it has two really important roles. Now, over here in my black vat, I have a pulp. Now, you might be able to see, it looks pretty green and putrid. <laughs> but it is true that this could irritate your hands and arms when you're doing the paper making. So one role for the aloe vera gel is that it suits that. But it also has a functional role to play. That gel helps these fibres that are going to make the paper to stay in suspension in the water of the vat. Because paper, the paper pulp always wants to settle to the bottom. So the aloe vera in this case is being what is called in paper making a formation aid. So now I'm going to show you how to make it. We you saw the big chunks go in, saw some water go in. Now 
If I've got this turned on, it should blend. Not too long. The reason being, you don't want the blending action, the cutting action of the blender to disturb the, the gels and break down their, their, their structure. So, next, sieving. So, you've seen my slimy green pulp. What am I going to do with the aloe vera? Well, I only want the gel. So, I'm going to sieve it through here. And you can see that viscous liquid pickling in. Now I'm doing it at this stage because in a few moments I'm going to talk to you about all the equipment you need to make paper at home from botanical first principles. And we want this, what this gel will do now, it will coat and surround every fibre in this vat with its viscous liquid and that's how it will become effective for us as a formation aid. So I'm going to leave it sitting there while I talk with you about all the other things you need if you want to have a go at this at home. So put it trickle into there. Now I'm sure you already noticed the blender. There are other ways to make paper without a blender, but I do recommend a really good heavy duty cafe strength blender with uh, at least a 120, uh, a 1200 watt motor in it. This one is about 20 years old, it's blended about a ton of paper but remember you must put in plenty of water when you go to blend your pulp, when you go to make the pulp so this pulp in the vats already been through the blending process but we have something over here to show you what it looks like before that now in my hands here are some cut off stalks of dietic which is one of the plants that I have growing here. And of course there are those times of year where you do have to cut things back. You don't have to use them straight away. This dietes will still be able to be cooked up and made into fiber, into, into paper. And to do that, it needs to be chopped up into lengths, not more than two centimeters if possible, although a couple of longer ones have sneaked in. And once you've chopped it up, it needs to be cooked. Now, this is not something that you'll do with your good old inside saucepans. This is something you need some dedicated pots for, which you'll always use, because you do have to add a strong caustic to these fibers to strip away all the gooey stuff that you don't want and retain the fibers, which is what makes the paper. When I say a caustic, it doesn't have to be anything super special. This is something you can buy in your supermarket. Very cheap. It's a washing. It's, it's a cleaning product. Put a half a cup in a washing machine. If, uh, if, uh, and I think you can even use it in the dishwasher. So just a little scoop like that. In a big pot like this. Will be enough to help break down your fibers. Once your fibers are fully cooked, they'll look soft and you can put them through your blender then. Now remember, you've got to add heaps of water. Don't try and kill your blender. But first of all, before you do that, you must rinse off that alkaline liquid. And that's why it's great if you've got a bit of a yard, you can put it through one of these big sieves, like we're seeing here. and you'll want to hose it off three or four times so that you 
bring the pH back to something approaching neutral. 7.2 is the ideal for a batch of paper, pulp to make paper. Okay. What are we going to get? What are we going to end up with when we make paper from plants? Well, it's probably not going to look like the paper you buy in your reflex pack for your, for your um, photocopier. And in fact, as I said earlier, you'll get a huge range of different colours and textures depending on what fibres you use and also you can do what's called multiple couching where you might put three or four layers of different papers on top of one another and your aloe vera comes in very handy there it helps glue it to, its, to the other layers now I want to particularly show you the latest paper I've made here turmeric paper now paper makers love paper that's crackly crackly paper is good paper to a hand paper maker so this turmeric paper has it in spades and it also has a very nice smooth finish and you're going to find out about that right now in the next step of the process which is called couching. Alright, so we just add the last of the aloe vera now to the pulp. And of course this is called the vat. And this essential piece of equipment here is a mould and decal. Now this particular one fits together nicely like that. So that when I submerge it, this decal will stay in position. The other essential piece of equipment you need is a couching pad which is better if it's a little bit domed in shape, and some nice layers of old sheet and blanket. So, couching from the French couchier to lie down. So we're gonna lie this sheet of paper down any moment now on that piece of purple sheet. So, I do have one friend that tells me that her men's shed made one of these. So, if you're finding it hard to get one, that could be a way to an avenue to check out. You can order them online, but quality, I have to say, is variable. So, remember it's a mould and decal for paper making. Now, you can see now that the the pulp from the vat has formed a thin sheet across the mesh of the mould. And now we want to transfer that onto here. So one edge goes down and it's a rolling motion. It comes up and leaves the sheet of paper behind. We'll just do another one just to make sure that you can see what to do. So you can see I am stirring it up a little bit in between dips. Despite the aloe vera, it still needs some stirring. So we're submerging it, we're bringing it up, shaking it to evenly disperse the fibres, and then we remove the excess fibre from the decal. And that just goes back into the vat and it'll become part of a future sheet when we dip again. So once you've removed that, it's usually safe to take the decal off. And once again, you can see our layer of pulp. Now I'm letting some of that water drain. What I usually do is prop up the decal there and make a little angle so that the water can drain because I can't cooch directly onto this sheet of paper or the two will stick to one another. So here's where my supply of old sheets and blankets comes in. One woolen layer to soak up the water and one cotton layer to cooch onto. Mm. It's a little bit windy, so I'll get that. <laughs>
Okay. So we're gonna plop our first side down. Once again, a rolling motion. Letting this side come up once the other side's gone down. And there you see we've now got two sheets of paper. Now, a pulp in this vat could make up to 20 sheets. A pile like this with pooching cloths in between is called a post of paper. But right now I'm going to go back to something I mentioned with the turmeric paper, how you can get a very smooth, silky surface. So to do that, I'll still need my wool layer. And instead of the cloth, I'm using one of these boards, which is something you can buy in kitchen shops for cutting up, for cutting on. They have one little bit matte surface and one very shiny surface. So we're going to work with the shiny surface here. So I'm mixing my pulp. Dunking my mould in depot, shaking it out to get even distribution, cleaning off the extra fibres off the depot, back into the vat. Because with all the work that it takes, you know, to cook all these and prepare them, you don't want to waste any. Deckel can come up. Remember that tip about propping it up there because that allows you to let your sheet drain. Now while it's running freely I'll wait and because I'm cooching now onto plastic which is less absorbent than the cloth I'll let it drain a little longer than I would if I were cooching onto cloth. I'm happy with that now. So we're going to see if we can cooch it onto the plastic. And there it is. So I can just drain a little excess off. So I'll leave that there. Now, if you're wanting to do quite a few onto plastic, you should do them all together, plastic on plastic on plastic. So you can see this is quite repetitious but not difficult. Most reasonably fit people can cooch this size. This size is what we call A4, which is what most copy paper is. It's the most common size paper produced in the Western world today. That doesn't mean you can't do bigger and smaller, but today, it's our first attempt, we go for the A4. Now, you can see a few really big hairy bits sticking out. It is okay to sort of coax them down, but on the other hand, you're making handmade paper, so you don't want it to look mass produced. So, once again, I'm going to take advantage of my angle here to drain some of the liquid off it while I get the woolen sheet on. So, woolen sheet, and now my next plastic. See that's fairly well drained now. So it's the same process as on the cloth, one side down, rolling motion, lifting it up and I'll just drain some of that excess liquid off. So just in this short time, we've made four sheets of handmade paper. So here we have 
host of papers, one on top of the other. I've lifted it off the couching pad and I'm putting it down here onto a piece of absorbent board. Now, being build, owner builders, we have a lot of offcuts left from all our building, so they're great and handy for this because your hardy plank is absorbent. And what I'm going to now do is stand on it. <laughs> so, there are sophisticated devices for this, but for the home paper maker, uh, 90 kilos should be sufficient. <laughs> But what I will do now, I can't afford to stand here all day, so I'm going to put a heavy, couple of heavy buckets on it to keep the pressure on it. And I will leave this paper here. So what is this doing? It's compressing the sheets and strengthening them. So I would leave this here overnight with, these, with this weight on it, and in the morning they can start to be dried. At the end of the session of couching, which we've seen previously, I laid all of these under two boards and put two heavy buckets on it. Now, that all happened last night, and now we're satisfied that our sheets have firmed and been compressed, and it's time to dry them. Now, one of the best reasons to cooch onto a light cotton like this is that you can then hang this up. And this is a much more space effective way to dry them than trying to lay them out unless you've got a very large courtyard or something like that. But it will only work for the ones on the cotton because some of them are cooched onto plastic. Now, the plastic does have to lie flat and basically you're looking for an area, a paved area or a sunny outdoor area to get them to dry nice and even and quickly. So we're examining each sheet as it comes off the stack. Sometimes the can have some imperfections or gaps that you may not have noticed when you're cooching it. But every sheet is normally useful because uh, when you go to assemble a book or any artwork with them, there'll be times when you want to part sheet or want to collage something. So we don't have to be too stressed if some of them have some little imperfections. Now these will dry on this little dryer within a day if conditions are fairly sunny and warm. And then, the, then comes the last stage of the whole process, which is the pressing. Now all papers made with a high proportion of botanical fibres will have a bigger tendency to buckle and warp than paper that's made from some kind of standard mix like in a mill. So your paper, once it dries on here, is going to need to spend between three and four days in a press to retain, to get the flatness you probably desire and for it to stay that way. And it's also important then when you're storing it to keep it on flat shelves because it can tend to buckle and cockle. With this post of paper, the first group of sheets were cooched onto plastic. And I find that that does give a very nice smooth surface on the side that contacts the plastic, which is good if you're wanting to write calligraphy on it or do some kind of fine ink work. So there's times when you might prefer that shiny surface. Now, if you have a look at these, these now need to go in onto my dry paver courtyard for a couple of hours in the sunshine. 
and oh, I don't know if you can see the texture on that this one has a, like a very coarse woven pattern on it and that is due to the cloth that I used to soak up the moisture it's not a woolen one it's it's an old bunny rug so you can deliberately put textures into your paper by the cloths that you use so all these now are going to take three to four hours in warm sun and then they'll start to curl off this off these plastic sheets and then of course they'll have to go in the press too along with the ones that dry on the cloth In front of me now is a handmade press. This is the final stage where you dry out, where you flatten out your dried and completed botanical paper. And as I have warned, if you're using a lot of these experimental fibres, you can get some pretty warped and buckled looking sheets. And you also get a very high shrinkage, so be prepared for that. But of course they have their unique charm. Now, this little press here was something that my sister gave to my daughter when she was little. And I reasoned that the same principle should be able to be applied to drying large sheets of paper. So, we, with the collaboration of my partner, we came up with this. So if you have a handy person in your life, or if you have the tools and the know-how, this is not a hard thing to make. And once it, the paper is in here, you get a very good result. But the paper must be dry. Don't try to put it in damp because it, it will mould. So once you're very confident that your paper is thoroughly dry, it can go in this for the press. And as you can see, you can re use some reclaimed timber from building jobs. And your old shifters and ring spanners never go astray either. Now I gave you a guideline before, three to four days in the press, that's the minimum. This has actually been in longer than that, so we hope we see a very nice flat paper. So, this is a marine ply, and marine ply is bought by how many layers are in it. So you can see one, two, three, four sandwiches and five thin layers. So it's called five ply. If you go to your hardware store, Bunnings, Mitre 10, whatever you've got, and ask for something like that, they will direct you to the right department. Now, here we have some A5 sheets that have been in the press for some time. And you can see that they are very nice. Just making sure this table's dry now. <laughs> and flat. And ready to be used for whatever project you've got in mind. Now, if you're going to have different sizes, you must have something smooth in between because you can see here we've gone on to some A4 size sheets. So you've got to separate your little A5s from your A4s. Now on here, you can see some of the kind of results that you get when that rock melon skin and those skeletonized leaves and those other things I showed you in the advanced class dry off. So here we've got a much darker paper than the one we worked with today but you can see you get some lovely effects from the from the little things that you collect from around the garden little pieces of fern and so on and this one has got a lot of pieces of another paper added to it and 
Now these are still a little bit buckled, so they could stay a bit longer in the press. And you'll find that anything with inclusions in it needs a bit more flattening because it gives the inclusions, even though we're using fairly thin stuff, it still causes a bit of warping and shrinking. So that's one batch. And then, see I've got another of these offcuts. And now we come to some older papers. Once again, we're going back to a paler color. And these have been in there. The, these were in there before the other lot was added and I've just put the board in and left them in there. And so you can see they've reached quite a nice stage of flatness and evenness. I advise at this stage, before you can forget, to get a little marker and write somewhere in an unobtrusive corner what fibres you used. You'll think at the start when you first get into the hobby, look I'll never forget that, I know that was my hippie astrum lilies, but once you get a few and the time goes by, it can become easy to forget. So you can see a contrast between these ones. This one is a ginger fiber. So before I pack these away, I will write on there the ginger, the, the fiber that was used. And usually I write the year. So uh, I recommend that as all part of your your scientific process because there, there may come a day when you say oh, I want that chocolate brown paper again what did I do all right and you'll have that nicely packed away with a little sign on top saying what you used so good luck on your paper making adventure and you can see here some of the wonderful variety of fiber of fibers and different textures and colors that it will give you so don't be afraid to experiment. Use what's, what's to hand and you'll get some great results.